We're building up godly men for a better tomorrow. This is On the Edge with Ken Harrison, where we inspire men of integrity to put faith into action together. And now, here's today's show. So Addison Bevere, man, I, I uh, it's funny because I'm like between you and your dad generationally. So I'm yeah. friends with both of you guys. And you're, you're more friends with me though. You guys. More friends with me. Well, it's this your, is, yeah, come on. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, actually. Um, but, but you guys, it, it, it's funny because um, I had had people forever trying to get me together with your dad, John, your, your parents are John and Lisa Bevere. And, and I was like, I, you know, in this in this world, when you're in Christian leadership, as you know, because you're in Christian leadership, people are saying, you got to meet this person, you got to meet that person. And it's like, uh, you know, when I have time. Then you and I went and hung out on this massive like, 45,000 acre ranch in Wyoming together. And we were mm-hmm. shooting guns and riding ATVs and fishing and with a bunch of other guys. And then having gotten to know you, I'm like, okay, I got to need to know this guy's dad because this guy is such a man of God, so wise. I want to meet his parents. And so then that's when um, Elliot and I got together with your mom and your dad and we had dinner and we spent like five hours just, just talking about fear of the Lord. It was an amazing time. And since then you and I have just spent a lot of time and there's, there's, we don't have any shallow conversations. I mean, you and I did not start off this morning talking about the college football rankings and where should the ducks be ranked or the Cincinnati Bearcats. I mean, we go straight to, you know, the deal. And so I wanted to share with the audience with this audience, I wanted to share your wisdom because I want to talk about fatherhood. And I, you're a man I know. I can trust your wisdom. I could trust you to to go deep and be introspective. And I want to ask you some really brutal questions, as we we kind of discussed earlier, so that I didn't throw you over the, the raft here. And I want to get kind of into it here pretty quick with with fatherhood because you're in the midst of it. So tell us um, just a little bit about yourself, your kids, your wife, how long you've been married, how old your kids are, and all that stuff, so that kind of guys know where you're coming from. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. So I've been married for 13 years, 35. So I'm at the top end of that millennial generation. My kids are 12, 10, seven, and five. And, um, love, love what I get to do being a dad. Honestly, it's, it's my favorite thing about life right now, being a dad, being a husband. Um, and then for work, I work for messenger international, Uh, We're an organization. We make discipleship resources available to everyone everywhere, regardless of where they live, what language they speak, or what their financial position looks like. So we've translated resources into over 140 languages, and we've distributed to um, believers all over the world over 50 million resources um, in their native language. And so we're leading leading the charge in um, 24 languages. We're the only organization providing discipleship resources. I don't so that's a brag. I'm just we're passionate about making discipleship resources available who don't available to those who don't have them. And um, it's the grace of God that has given us the opportunity to do that. So that's what I do professionally. Um, family on the family side. That's where I'm at. That's my season. When I look at you, Ken, you're 31 years. So reverse the 13. You get 31. 31 so years I'm, of marriage. 31 Not years age. of marriage. <laughs> Not age, sorry. 31 years of marriage. And so, you know, I'm humbled. I'm honored that you would invite me on to have this conversation because, as you know, I'm still in the throes of it. I have a 12-year-old, so I'm just entering those teenage years, the preteen years. And um, I, But I've loved it. I've loved every minute of it. And I've also been blessed, as you alluded to earlier, I've been blessed with amazing parents. Um, I have three brothers who love God who are serving God, who love each other, who love their parents. I think that's a miracle in today's world too. And so whatever is is happening in our family is happening across generations. And um, we're really thankful for that. So which of the 47 genders are your four kids? <laughs> it's a question that's coming up. So that's why I'm saying that. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, got, I've got two boys and two girls. <laughs> Dude, I don't I'm know if that was you. the politically correct answer, but two boys, two girls. That's, that's what I. That's what I have. That's that's what they identify as. So, yeah, good. And we want to honor sons. you know because kids yeah, know two, exactly what they want to be. Always two sons and two yeah. daughters. I remember when I was twelve. Uh, you knew I everything. Wanted, 
Oh, well, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> the, the older I get, the dumber I get. But I wanted to be a bush pilot in Alaska. I, I wanted to have like a cabin in the woods where I never had to deal with anybody. And I would just like fly around fighting fires or something. You know, I mean, I, it, it, when you're that young, you don't have a clue what you want to do or what you want to yeah. be. You don't, don't even know. know who you are. Yeah, I could see you doing that, Ken. I don't know. You might have been on yeah. something as a 12 year old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the more I get to know people, the more that's starting to sound good. <laughs> yeah yeah no, so, so so let me ask you yeah you had you you were raised in a way that um your dad's been pretty candid about his journey your dad was was a very well known speaker all over and he was pretty tough he mellowed out a lot as he got older S severe bevere that was his nickname. severe bevere and yet severe. he he raised four really godly sons so, you know, your dad would say he is an example of someone who can get it wrong, who can be maybe a little hard in yeah. the name of Jesus, and yeah. yet his kids can still end up being really godly. Because I think a lot yeah. of guys need to hear that. Yeah, and I would also say my dad is someone who matured, and I watched him mature. It's not that his convictions changed, but the way he expressed those convictions and the way he invited other people into those convictions changed drastically, even in his public ministry, the way he would write, the way he would teach. And uh, people ask me all the time, they ask me like, what, what did your dad do right? Specifically my dad, because they have this idea of my dad as someone who maybe is legalistic or too intense or too severe, or too works oriented. And we've seen the fruit of that in our world. We've seen the negative response to the rigidity of religion. And so I, I think people are surprised when they see our relational dynamic and they see the love, they see the trust, they see the togetherness. And they're like, how how does this come from that? And what I tell them is I, I tell them that my dad is a man of great humility. And that, that kind of surprises them. They're like, wait, like John Bevere is a man of great humility. Like my dad is a man of great humility. My dad, growing up, I heard my parents apologize to us kind of almost on the daily. Like my parents, oh, oh my gosh, my parents were so intense. They would call it intense fellowship. Uh, they did. They were parents who like argued in front of their kids sometimes, had intense <laughs> conversations, things like that. Um, but then they would come to us and they would apologize and they would say, look, the way we behaved, it doesn't align with what we've taught you boys. It doesn't align with the people that we know God has called us to be. And they would come to us and humble themselves. I mean, I... Can I remember multiple times when my dad, he would discipline me in anger and then he would come back to me and he would say, son, I'm so sorry. Like, I, I was right in, in the sense like I needed to correct you, but I disciplined you in anger and that was wrong. And instead of viewing that as, hey, oh, no, I'm going to undermine the good that I'm doing as a father teaching my son. He viewed it as actually, you know, what? being humble right now in this moment is even more important than my son remembering what he got corrected for. Like remembering this moment with his father is going to mean more in his development as a man um, than even the, the correction that was related to whatever infraction I'd committed in that moment. And so humility creates a lot of safety. It just does. And I mean, you know this in every relational dynamic, First Peter 5, James 4, we read that God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes or frustrates the proud. And so when we're humble, there is a grace that enters into our dynamics um, that allows us to do things that we otherwise couldn't do and become things that we otherwise couldn't become. And that's the that's the miracle. That's the power of grace. And I would say we saw a lot of grace operative in our family um, because of the way my parents humbled themselves in their own journey of learning and becoming but that didn't require them to throw out their convictions or be wishy-washy or not be people of substance. They were very much people of substance, but they recognized that, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, we know in part, we prophesy in part, and a part of the outworking of love in our lives is the humility um, that creates space for us to learn and grow together. So it seems like, you know, one of the main things I see in men today uh, is blaming their dad for everything. Yeah. And... Um, you you haven't gone down that road. Do you, it, do you think? No, I did. His... I did go down that road. I did. Oh, you I did. did. Oh, yeah. For, well, a, for at thirty five, you're certainly not there. <laughs> no, no. I I what, did. What, what caused you to get over that? 
Well, I wanted my dad to be God for me. And so I put expectations on my dad, especially during those years from like 17 to 22. Um, I wanted my dad to be the picture of God that could be the foundation for the rest of my life. And I felt like there was a lack of relational connection between my father and I, and our relationship um, was too transactional. And, and so I, I pushed back against that and I demanded that my dad become something more than what he was. Now, my dad grew up with a father. Yeah. My dad grew up with a father who like might've told him twice his entire life that he loved him, right? Like that, that kind of dad worked hard, provided for his family, did what he needed to do. Um, just a byproduct of a different time, a different generation. And so my dad, when you look at my dad's development as a father, specifically on the relational front, he took massive strides, but instead of celebrating that and championing it, um, my tactic was to make him feel less than in order for him to give me what I thought I wanted from a father. And Ken, it was amazing. The years when I tried to coerce my dad into giving me something that I didn't know how to give were the worst years of our relationship. And he just pulled away because he felt like he was failing at every turn. He just felt like whatever he did, it wasn't good enough. Um, and I was quick to point out where he was missing the mark. And then the Holy Spirit showed me, like, look, if you will give your father to me, I'll give you back the father that you've always wanted. And in the meantime, you're actually going to discover the heart of your heavenly father in a way that you never discovered it before. And I did that, Ken. And my dad, when I released him from that pressure of being a certain father, when I released him of that pressure, my dad came back as the most amazing father. Like the relational skills that I would try to like force him to develop or the desire to spend time with me or different things like that. <laughs> like it just, I'm serious. Like it just came. Like it fled. It's like when I released him and gave him to God. Um, it was amazing what God did through uh, through my father and I's relationship. And I think that's true for any any relational dynamic. When we make an idol of that dynamic, whether it's a father, a spouse, a mother, a child, um, when we make an idol of that dynamic, meaning we try to draw strength from that relationship that we should be drawing from our relationship with God, we place that person in a position where they're only going to fail. They're going to fail us eventually. And I think it's difficult for, for society right now, especially the young men who are hearing the toxic masculinity narrative or hearing the absent father narrative. It's difficult for them to entrust their fathers and that lack because it's a real sense of lack. I'm not saying that the pain wasn't real. I'm not saying that the lack wasn't real. It's very difficult for them to entrust that to their heavenly father. Um, but that's exactly what we have to do. That's, I mean, that's exactly what the next generation needs from us as future fathers. That's exactly what they need us to do. Otherwise, we are going to perpetuate the same narrative and extend the same brokenness. So I got a call from this uh, rock star. I mean, a really well-known rock star. He called me. He wanted to get some masculinity advice from the guy who runs Promise Keepers. And, uh, it, it, you know, it was, it was kind of cool, but he spent a lot of the time just talking about how awful his father was. And then he spends the time talking about how it was his, his dad who encouraged him to practice and get really good at it, you know, um, at what he played and all that stuff. And after he got done telling me how bad his dad was, then he starts telling me how bad his kids are. And as he started talking about how jacked up his kids are, he, he blamed it all on his wife. And I said, so this is interesting. I said, so your dad is responsible for everything that's wrong with you, but you're not responsible for anything that's wrong with your kids. It's all your wife's fault. And he was quiet for a minute. I go, dude, I, I think you need to start to grow up. And um, he got off the phone with me and we never talked again. But <laughs> I find this to be a very common theme. I had another guy, man, it was unbelievable, who, who wanted to take me to lunch. He was a well-to-do businessman. He was in his late 70s. And in his, as he was talking to me, he was he said, tell me all about your dad. I said, dude, I, don't, I really don't know you that well. I'm not interested in telling you about my dad. 
And uh, he, well, I'll tell you about, you know, and he started to go down the road of, you know, everything that was wrong with him in his life was his dad's fault because his dad came home from World War II with PTSD and was a terrible father on and on. And that's why he was divorced. And that's why his kids were all jacked up. It was all because of his father. And then later on in the conversation, he starts telling me what a great Christian his father was. Oh, he's loved the Lord. I'm, like, I'm not making the connection. Oh, well, you see, my dad, uh, I was born when he was at war. So mom got pregnant. Dad goes to World War II. He's born. He didn't come home till I was five. Okay. He got saved when I was six and a half and became an amazing father. So I said, you're telling me that all these decades later, your kids are screwed up. You've had two divorces. And it's all because your dad was a crummy father between the ages of five and six and a half. Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. Wow. We have come to this point in our culture where men are sniveling, whiny little um, babies, blaming their fathers for everything. And, and you're sitting here saying it wasn't perfect with your dad. And you're actually taking responsibility as a 17 to 22 year old going, you know, I was a big part of the reason why it wasn't good with my dad, which is an amazing thing because I've never heard anybody take responsibility for them as a son having a problem with their father. Yeah, well, and as I mentioned earlier, Ken, I'm not going to tell you that it was easy. It was it was the grace of God. And I don't want to belittle people's daddy issues. Um, and I don't even mean daddy in a common sense way. I mean, that's. That's real. There are a lot of messed up people in our world today um, who trace the source of their pain, the source of their frustration with life, with relationship back to their father dynamic. And I do think it's significant um, that that the father figure is under so much attack. When we look at the um, the family unit and the new left's attack on the family unit, it's primarily an attack on the father. And uh, an attack on what the father has been or hasn't been. And so um, for me, and again, like I don't, I want to be careful how I go about this. But for me, I realize that God does an imperfect, or he, God does a perfect work through imperfect people. And that includes our dynamic with our father. It's in Hebrews 12, where the writer of Hebrews talks about how fathers, they discipline us based on the best that they know how, right? Like they, they discipline us that, that we would grow, that we would flourish, that we would mature, but God, he disciplines us that we would share in his holiness. He disciplines us so that we would know something different, something other, something beyond the brokenness and the fragmentation that mars our humanity. And so for me, I, it wasn't until I realized that God was still doing a perfect work in my life through an imperfect father, that I was actually able to release grace to my father so he could become more of a perfect father. And you know, it's, it's a cycle. And we talked about it earlier when we make an idol of a spouse or a father figure or a mother figure, and we try to draw strength from them or a sense of person from them that is beyond what they're able to give to us, then that relational dynamic inevitably breaks down. The whole idea of Romans one, where um, Paul's writing about the journey of humanity and how um, we exchanged a true idea of God for creations that were either a reflection of what we could create within or what we see without, then we started to literally go insane. And that's what idolatry does. Idolatry causes insanity. The fruit of idolatry is insanity. And so I think we're seeing a lot of people with, and again, I don't want to trivialize this, but a lot of people with mental issues because they created an idol in and of their father. And society, in a weird, twisted way, tells us your father, in a sense, like should have been a perfect God to you. And if your father wasn't a perfect God, you have every excuse for throwing out the system, for throwing out traditional design, for throwing out convention, for jettisoning family, um, because your, your father wasn't perfect. And I think that's why Jesus, particularly in John's gospel, we see from John 5 to John 17, just, just in those chapters, we see Jesus refer to God as Father over a hundred times. Just, just during just during that that short bit in the in the Gospel of John, over a hundred times, because he's saying, Look, like understanding who God is as Father is going to change everything. And what you've seen is partial. 
But if you lean into the spirit of God, if you trust in the greater reality that is the kingdom of God, you're going to start seeing every relationship different, which is going to cause you to flourish in all of your relationships. Because you and I know this, the kingdom of God advances at the intersection of relationship. Every significant bit of brokenness in our lives is a reflection of a shaking or a brokenness of relationship. And that's because God created us for a relationship. And what's ironic and tragic is the only way that we can truly break relationship is we refuse to be reconciled, refuse to extend forgiveness, refuse to see the other people as imperfect and as a work in progress. Like that's the only way that relationships truly break down beyond repair. I think, um, you know, one of the problems we have is that so many boys and girls do this too, but I think it's very prevalent with boys. They see their father as the perfect hero, as you were sort of alluding to as when they're young, yeah. you know, boys will argue about whose dad is tougher than whose dad and whose dad's cooler than whose dad and all that. And I've always joked about Chad, H Chad Hennings was on the board of promise keepers, who was a jet fighter pilot. And then won three Super Bowl rings for the Dallas Cowboys. Like his son never lost that argument. <laughs> okay. Okay, listen, I used to lie. I'm ashamed to say I used to lie to the kids in um, in my kindergarten, first grade class. I would tell them my dad was on the power team. And my dad's like 100. <laughs> my dad, like no one would believe that for a second. He's like 150 pounds at the time. Skinny guy. Like there was no way he was on the power team. But for me, like my dad was on the power team. And I would That's tell awesome. people that. <laughs> well, my dad was a professional boxer, an LA cop, and a, and he was a Mr. Cleveland in powerlifting. So I, I literally had like this dad that was watching the life. But the problem is, then you get to a point of of uh, age where you start to see that your dad's not perfect, and then a lot of men, young men, begin to resent their father for not being the perfect hero that they built him up to be in their minds, and then they hold a bitterness against him that they never let go. So we don't want to belittle people's issues with their father because some of them are real. But for most of them, it's time to grow up and get over it. And I would just say, you know, I see guys in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who, and I, I told a couple of extreme stories, but I see them all the time of guys who run around and everything in their life is about their dad. Grow the heck up. It's time to be your own man. God's going to judge you on you. He's not going to judge you based on your dad or your wife or anybody else. He's going to judge you on you. So, Ken, can I, can I interject one thing, though? I am no. not, I'm not trying. No. Uh, hey, listen, I'm going to disagree <laughs> with you on something. So you might want to say no, but I was going to say, I don't know if the terminology get over it is the right terminology. I think, I think the terminology is reframe it, face it, like address it. The, don't see, hide that's from that, it. That's that sensitive millennial generation. <laughs> see, that's, that's, exactly, right. that's exactly what it is. Like, <laughs> let's, Hey, let's do this. Let's have the courage to go back and let's reframe it. Let's reframe it under the banner of this is an imperfect father doing what he knew he could do sometimes other times. Yeah. He, he knew he was doing wrong and he still did it. But the truth is, and God promises us that he can work through the brokenness and the sin of our world to forge an eternal beauty in us. That's the big idea in second Corinthians four Romans eight. Like that's how God works. It's what Peter writes in first Peter five, God himself will establish, restore, confirm, validate, like God's going to do that at the right time. And so I, what I would encourage people to do, because, you know, the, the therapeutic space would say, oh man, don't push it down. Don't get over it. Like you need to face it. So let's fight fire with fire. Let's say, Hey, face it, but let's face it under the banner of truth. Let's face it under the banner of the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God is designed to reframe and reshape relationships. And I think if people do that, they're going to go back and they're going to find a lot of compassion and a lot of understanding, especially the young men who are now fathers, especially the young men are in the throes of it. And instead of blaming their wives for the dysfunction or brokenness in their family, they're going to realize, wow, my refusal to confront, my refusal to grow up, my refusal to forgive is perpetuating a cycle that I am now responsible for. This is no longer my father's responsibility. This is my responsibility. And I'm going to face off and I'm going to ask that the spirit of God will come in and fill the holes where there has been lack. Like, Ken, what is this illusion out there? Like everyone's got to have it perfect. And if they didn't have it perfect, they can't build something meaningful. That's just ridiculous. 
Where does that even work? Like what planet are we living on? The reality is, and Paul with great passion says in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And he's quoting God. My grace is sufficient for you for my power works best in your weakness or human inability. Like God, this is a weak area. I didn't have a good father in this area. I didn't have a good example here. But Holy Spirit, the one who reveals the heart of the eternal father, Holy Spirit, please, I need that nuanced understanding. I need the situational awareness. I need the emotional intelligence, whatever it is. I need it. Come. I yield myself to you. Come and do what I cannot do in my own strength. What would happen, Ken, if a generation of fathers took that approach to the challenges that they find themselves in with their own family and their own marriages instead of looking back the line and saying, man, if my father was just less screwed up, I'd be in a better place. That was great. And it was exactly what I said by get over it. I mean, I, I said three <laughs> la- three words and that. <laughs> you know, that listen, whole millennial you're, sensitivity you're, listen, long thing. Listen, listen, you give the short, pithy three words, get over it. I provide the nuance for the people who are go. like, oh, wait, what? Get over it. <laughs> um, that's why we need both, though. That's why we need, seriously, Ken, that's why we need both generations to have a seat at this table when we're having is. these and- conversations. And when I say get over it, what I mean is what you said. Um, but we take the words of Christ in Matthew, uh, I think it's chapter six, which are so harsh, which is, you know, if if you want, if you if you hate your brother, you've murdered him in your heart, right? And then if you looked at a woman in lust, you've you, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. And then he says, uh, if your eye causes you to lust, cut it out of your head. It's better to enter into heaven with one eye than into hell with two. So Jesus is being extremely harsh there, and so. You take somebody who has had serious abuse issues, they're addicted to pornography, their their life revolves around lust. And to say, dude, I mean, to use Jesus's words, but what, what our Lord is saying there is do what it takes to get over it. So it's not saying be super strong, you're Clint Eastwood, just ignore it. But if you need counseling, get counseling. If you need to be in a group of friends, get into a group of friends. But whatever it takes, stop your sin. Because what we have to remember when it comes to father issues and we'll move on from this here in a minute to son's issues. But, um, you know, Christ said the measure that you use to forgive is what is going to be used against you. And you really nailed something there a minute ago, which is you're holding all this bitterness against your dad and you got sons. Well, how do you how do you think how do you want them to see you in 15 years? How do you want them to judge you? So m- maybe you got to believe the words of our father, of our of our Lord. Maybe you need to forgive your father so that your sons will forgive you. I'll give you the yeah. last thing on that because you have a way of saying things much more sensitively. No, I can't. I, th- <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought that was fantastic. I mean, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, and to to reference another part of that passage, I mean, we're told, "Hey, don't worry about the uh, the little splinter in your in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own." And I think for us, and in Luke's gospel, so jumping over to Luke's gospel. If you look at the proximity of that statement right afterwards, he's talking about judging. And the truth is, and you talk about bearing fruit. And the truth is, it's not our responsibility. I know we all feel this pressure to be judges of the world and to know everything and in a world of cancel culture, in a world where if you say the wrong thing in the wrong place, you might be done. There is this temptation to present ourselves as an authority on everything. But that's just ridiculous. Like we should release ourselves of the pressure to judge everything. Even Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, look, I don't even judge myself. He's like, look, I don't have the perspective. I don't have the eternal perspective to really know what's going on here. I don't understand the ins and outs of every single person involved. But when we approach a dynamic with humility, when we truly do take that log out of our own eye, then we we have the wisdom, we have the fortitude, we have the know-how to take the splinter out of the other person's eye. And I would I would say, at least in my experience, it was like, look, I had this log in my my own eye when it came to my father. And and I'm not gonna point blame as far as like how that log developed, but there was a log in my eye. I had to allow the Holy Spirit to take the log out of my eye. And then my relational dynamic with my dad, it's like the Holy Spirit through very little participation on my part, took the splinter out of my father's eye. And then both of us were able to see with greater clarity. And I think, I think that's what 
God is calling us to do as the people of God, as the people who claim like we participate in ultimate reality. Everything else that people claim as truth at best is a partial truth. It's a half truth. If we're going to be people of conviction and people of substance, we got to stop being tossed around by all of the opinions and all of the emotions and all of the winds. And we've got to be firm. We are people who know the way, the truth, and the life. We need to act like it. We need to not act like little spoiled children who aren't getting their way and throw a tantrum when the world doesn't line up with what they think it should look like. We need to be circumspect. We need to be aware. We need to be intentional. We need to be compassionate. And I think, of course, all of those wonderful and challenging things begin at the homes. What better place to start than with the difficult family dynamics that we find ourselves in? Today's episode is brought to you through the generosity of Waterstone. For nearly 40 years, Waterstone has assisted givers in supporting their favorite charities, like Promise Keepers, by crafting customized, innovative giving solutions. Waterstone gift strategists stand ready to create your personalized charitable plan, utilizing business interests, real estate, appreciated assets, charitable trusts, giving funds, and more. These donor-specific giving strategies allow givers to bypass capital gains taxes, receive a fair market value charitable deduction, and have tax-free growth for years to come. Prioritize income, minimize taxes, and optimize your giving with Waterstone. Find out how to give and receive the most from your assets by visiting www.waterstone.org. Most of us listening to this podcast right now are parents or going to be parents. Um, let's ask some of the tough questions, Addison. How how do you respond in this generation to the cultural pressures being put on your kids? I mean, your your oldest is just entering into puberty, um, yep. which is, uh, boy, that's a whole... Uh, and I'll just say, in my experience, boys are a lot easier to handle than girls when it comes to <laughs> because boys yeah. are all about sort of Lord of the Flies survival. Uh, girls, holy cow, the pressures, the peer pressure when they suddenly start to all want to be pretty and be attractive. And and the pressures that you as a parent are putting up with, I never put up with. I mean, we did not have phones that could get pornography for most of my kids upbringing. Um you got to deal with stuff that's just unbelievable. So how, how are you handling those, those pressures that um, those of us who are never, never had to, but what we're going to have to with our grandkids, because we want to give wise counsel to our children. Sure. I would say for us, um, we viewed the pressures as an opportunity um, for intentionality within our family. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. It used to be okay for, the father to have the birds and the bees conversation, like the talk, right? Like the talk, like you check a box and then it's done. Right? Well. There was the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember it well. There was that I one time. I remember mortified and disgusted. <laughs> My yeah. dad shouldn't have done it when I was like nine. I was not old enough. I was like, you, you and mom do what? <laughs> yeah. I, was, I had so, nightmares see, for like a month. <laughs> listen, in, in context and nuance, right, are very important here. Um, But I think the days of, hey, like sex and sexuality and gender, like this is a conversation that we have one time with our children and kind of check a box and move on. Those days are long gone. Well, that's good advice. That's a very uh, astute observation right there. Again, that a lot of people don't realize that. Sure, sure. And so for me, um, you know, being again a millennial, 35 years old, I, um, I came of age at the very beginning of uh, some of these things, like the very beginning of social media. Social media was just coming onto the scene when I was graduating high school. So, Did you have a MySpace account? I Listen, Ken, I had a MySpace account. I had a top eight. (laughs) I had music. I I did a little HTML to customize it. I definitely had a MySpace page. Um, (laughs) So, in fact, funny story, I actually got to know my wife a bit on MySpace, but we we won't, really? We won't go. Yeah, that's. As I've heard a lot of those stories. I don't think I knew yeah. that one. No, you, I didn't. I didn't explain that it was over MySpace just because I, I'm still battling some shame. 
um, <laughs> there. But but for for us, for Julie and I, what we've done is we've said, okay, how do we turn this not into a single, like we don't want to just have a single conversation and have the conversation right with the right book and say the right buzzwords or whatever. But like, how do we make this an ongoing conversation about God's design for humans what it means to flourish as a human as far as our sexual expression, because sexuality and sex should not be taboo. The world, and you know that, I mean, you're, you're someone when we have conversations, like I don't feel uncomfortable talking to you about these different things. Like you get that. Okay. (laughs) This is true. Um, But the world unfortunately has occupied a space that we kind of are like, Oh, it's dirty. It's taboo. We can't really talk about that. And they've set up shop and now they're defining the narrative they're determining the terminology and we're trying to play catch up. And all we're doing is trying to rebuke what uh, provide our rebuttals or confute or refute what they're saying instead of leading the way and writing our own story that is ultimately um, reflective of the meta narrative that we see in scripture. So for us, Ken, it was how and when do we start this conversation? How do we continue it? So I started talking to Asher, my firstborn, when he was eight years old about sex and sexuality. By the time he was nine, he knew what masturbation was. He knew pornography. He knew um, he knew a lot about sex and sexual, uh, like different sexual contexts. And he knew about um, same sex attraction. He knew about gender dysphoria. We were already wow. there by the time he was at 10. Nine. Oh, nine, 10. We were, we were completely Ooh. there at okay. 10. Okay. Um, and he was mature enough to be able to comprehend what you're talking about. He was because I started two years before I actually got there. So, so the you first had a plan. Time I, I had a plan. And so I started talking about human sexuality and shame. That's where that's where I went hard. Shame. Because a lot of the shame that people feel and they project on or toward God is related to their sexuality. And so I went after that at the very, very beginning of his life. And I was like, look, when it comes to your sexuality, the father, this dynamic, this is not a dynamic that shame should be a part of in any sense of the word. God designed you to be a sexual being. It's a part of his plan, his redemptive plan for this world for us as humans, like, so we need to explore what that looks like and what that means for you personally, for you as an individual. And so we would have those conversations. And even now, Kent, Julie and I are very open. Like my kids will straight up, and some parents are probably going to disagree about this, but my parents or my kids will straight up ask me, they were like, dad, were you a mom just having sex or like making love? Like they, (laughs) I'm not kidding. Like that's how, like, it's like, that's a normal part of what we do you know, as, as a couple, like that's a part of what God designed us. Like it's not something gross. It's not something taboo. Now, obviously we're not like trying to give them hints or anything, but they're smart kids and they start to pick up on things. And so that's been a big part of it. It's just being intentional to get in front of the conversation. That way we're not reframing stuff, but we're actually getting to set the terms and, and create the space for the conversation. And so my seven-year-old Ken, my seven-year-old daughter, she knows what sex is. My seven-year-old daughter. She understands the anatomy of sex. Now, she's earlier in the journey of conversation, but I'm telling you, kids are going to find out about this stuff at seven, eight, nine years old. I've been mentoring a young man. He he was he became addicted to pornography and masturbation eight years old. Eight, eight. years old. Eight years old. Holy cow. Eight years old. He's 31 years old. And for the first time in his life, first time in his life, he has gone 100 days without looking at pornography or masturbating. 100 days. And the freedom since he was eight years old, the freedom that he's experienced. And for us, we had to do a breakdown of shame because there was so much shame attached to his sexuality. We had to systematically go through the root of that shame before he could experience the kind of freedom that he's experiencing now. And so seeing that um, in my own life and seeing it in the lives of the people that I've been able to do life with, I'm like, listen, I'm not. I'm getting out in front of this. I will not allow my kids to navigate this shame. I'm going to do whatever I can to get out in front of it. So I'm talking to Addison Bevere, who's written a couple of really excellent books. And um, really, uh, we got to have you on more and more because you have so much good stuff to say. Um, but I want to ask you the tough question. So you've had these conversations with your kids. So you're way ahead of most 
fathers, right? I mean, you had a plan, you, you, you understood what was going on. And so pe some people listening are thinking, well, how do I, how do I make up for that now? My son's 17, you know, what do I do now? What do you do or how will you handle it if one of your kids uh, comes to you and says, hey, dad, I'm homosexual or hey, dad, um, I, I've got gender dysphoria and I, you know, I'm, I'm a girl and I, I want to be a boy. How are you going to handle that situation as a, as a Christian leader? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Number one, I would, I would hope my son or my daughter wouldn't come to me using language like that. And, and I'll explain, <laughs> hold on. No, no, here, here's, here's what, and, I, and I'll say what I would do if they did come to me using language like that. But I would hope because of things that we've done, my child would never come to me and say, I am anything other than a child of God. Okay. Gotcha. So, the, so even calling like, I am a homosexual, what I'm essentially doing is I'm putting my um, sexual orientation ahead of my identity as a son or daughter of God. And I, and I think what, what we've done, and I think the church and Christendom and church culture needs to take an honest look at itself. What we've done is we've ostracized people who have navigated same sex, same sex attraction or gender dysphoria. And we've been like, these, these are signs of brokenness that we're just not comfortable navigating. So if you have any thoughts along those lines, or if you feel an inclination toward any of the behaviors that would be associated with feeling that way, y'all, y'all need to keep that hidden, figure it out. And then once you get your stuff together, you can return to church culture, return to an um, open family dynamic. And so what I was getting at is my hope would be if my son or my daughter, if they're navigating thoughts of gender dysphoria or same sex attraction, that we would already be having conversations about that. Well, that's um, good. Because we all kind of, you know, this like we all have a broken sexuality that has to be surrendered to God. Every single man, woman, child, we have a broken sexuality that has to be surrendered to God. Can I personally believe that 50% of pastors are looking at porn on the regular because they view themselves as, oh, hey, I'm a heterosexual man. I don't have a broken sexuality that I need to give to God. Or it's just like, oh, just the people who are same-sex attracted, people who are navigating gender dysphoria, they're broken. No, all of us, every single one of us, have a broken sexuality that needs to be surrendered to God. Let me let me to interject just real quick no. to, to bring a little bit of clarity. Sexually, we're designed for one man, man to be with one woman for a lifetime, and those two become one flesh. That was the beginning of creation. God said, this is how it's supposed to be. So to be attracted to anybody other than your wife or your husband is an example of the fact that you have a broken sexuality because we are not totally content with our spouse. So that's what you're saying. And so just, just so anybody listening goes, well, I don't have a broken, that's what you mean. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what I mean. What I mean is our idea of who we are as a sexual person needs to be surrendered to the eternal truth of God. Yes. It just does. Whether, whether that's a same sex attraction or that's an opposite sex attraction, we need to surrender it to God. And I, I was actually mentoring a young man who is navigating both same sex attraction and, and gender dysphoria right now. So he's, he's navigating both of them. And he told me recently, he's like, man, I really want, I really want to date a guy because you know, I've been, I've been looking for this, this form of companionship. And I just told him, I said, you're not going to find what you're looking for dating that guy. Like until you surrender your idea of you to God, you will not find yourself fulfilled in anyone else or in any other situation. This is why Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15 about dying daily. Like we have this opportunity to surrender our idea of human flourishing to God on the daily to experience the miracle of resurrection power, which is what 1 Corinthians 15 is all about. It's about the miracle of resurrection power. Like God will do a miraculous work in our lives if we surrender our lives to him. And that includes our sexuality. Where it gets tricky, Ken, I think this is why a lot of parents are navigating territory, feeling ill-equipped, is because we as a church, we treated the brokenness of our sinfulness that expresses itself in different forms of dysphoria or same-sex attraction. We've treated that as something different, something other, instead of bringing that into the fold and submitting it to the grace of God and the transforming work of his grace. I kind of feel like this. If you look at the, the spectrum of response 
to, to the issue of same-sex attraction or gender dysphoria, you'll find two extreme responses to what's happening in our world today. You have the people on one side who say, hey, it's all good. It's all good. Like whatever you feel, that's true. And essentially what we're saying is you need to, uh, there's no greater design. You need to cause whatever you feel internally to be Lord of your life and get scripture, get God's design to submit or to succumb to whatever you feel. Like there's no greater truth that extends beyond this moment or extends beyond what you feel. What you feel right now is ultimate and final and eternal. And that is the truth. Okay. So you have that side. And then the other side, you have people who are so terrified of the brokenness um, of, you know, someone who's confused about their gender or confused about attraction. And they're like, we don't want anything to do with you. Like that's a cardinal sin. Get out of here. We don't want you. And what I find is both extremes suffer from the same root issue. You'll often find this when you find a matter um, where you have two groups that are polarized and you have this dualistic approach. You actually find that they both suffer from the same root condition. And that is a lack of belief in God's transforming power. Both sides suffer from a lack of belief that God will move into the messiness of our situation. This is what Jesus did. Jesus broke down their idea of how God engages with sin. Jesus got into the messiest of the situations of his day. Prostitutes, sinners, tax collectors, disenfranchised, marginalized, even Pharisees and the hypocritical. He got involved with all of them. He got involved with the sin and his presence, his awareness of the greater kingdom reality, his being led by the spirit, allowed him to introduce them to a new reality. And so for me, I'm like, listen, let's just believe that God is who he says he is. And let's allow him to be Lord of our lives, even of our sexuality, especially in a culture that says sexuality is Lord over everything. Oh, that was an amazing answer. Um, on the nitty gritty side, your kids aren't old enough yet to have come to you, but mine have come to me and said, hey, dad, you know, if I told you I was gay, what would you do? And what they're really asking, they're not asking that question. They're asking, where is my relationship with you? would you reject me? Right. It's a deeper question. And, you know, my, my son, a college wrestler, my other son, macho, godly man, you know, jujitsu guy, my daughter, very feminine married. So it's not a real, it, they're not asking me a real question. Sure. Um, there has to be a bigger question. And my answer to them has been, you will never stop being my child. Just That's like right. you will never stop being God's child. You put your belief in him and I will love you no matter what you do. I would love you if you were an ax murderer, uh, but I would still turn you in and you, you would still go to jail. And then I would come visit you in the jail because I would stand for justice. But nothing you can do would ever separate my love from you. However, your lifestyle would not be welcomed into this house. Um, and then I go into the broader thing. So you, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to stay. But your boyfriend wouldn't be allowed to come into this house. But that's not a that's not limited to homosexuality, and this is where I think a lot of Christians get this kind of thing wrong. And there's a hypo, hypocriticalness that can come. I said, if you had an affair with a married woman and took her from her husband, she wouldn't be allowed to this house either, and I would not attend your wedding because you would need to repent and go back to her. You would still be my son. You would still always be welcome here. You would still come over here for Christmas, but your sin is not welcome because I'm not going to affirm your sin. People can have different opinions on that. My wife and I talked about that, and you know, we're on the same page, and and we are on that one. Um, well, we are on most things, but um, I, so uh, from my from a where does the rubber meet the road? I think uh, the advice I want to give to fathers is a lot of times when your kids are asking a question, they're not asking you the question they're asking; they're asking you a different question. And for my son, it is he was he was pointing, he was pushing. I think all three of my kids asked me at some point that question. Um, what they're asking is. Is there anything that could separate your love from me? And they're also saying, are you a hypocrite? Because if you say you believe what you believe, and if I was gay and you wouldn't let my boyfriend in here, but if I was having a, an extramarital affair, you'd let my girlfriend in here, then you don't really believe what you say. And that's why I found it necessary to go to the next level. I love you no matter what. But any kind of blatant sin that you have will never be allowed into this house. Um, it would stop at the door. If you were living with your girlfriend um, and you came over, you guys would be in separate rooms um, because that, that sin is not allowed in this house. Um, 
So I think, you know, just from a practical piece of advice for parents who are wondering about, well, how do I handle some of this stuff? Your answer is just boom. I mean, it's the bigger picture. And then I want to give a little bit of a, if you've got a 16 year old who asked you that question, bear in mind, what are they really asking? You know? Yeah. I can, I think that's everything. I think you hit the nail on the head. And I think for us too, as sons and daughters who are training up sons and daughters, we have to remember that there's nowhere in scripture where it says that we reconcile God to us. It says that God <laughs> reconciles us to him. Okay. Yeah. So there's something so powerful that happens when we realize that we are reconciled to God and that God loves us. He is for us. And any prohibition, any command, quote unquote command, which you know, Jesus had all sorts of things to say about their idea of morality as expressed through the law. And he, he was revealing a new law of liberty that was much more nuanced and much more personal, much more specific. Um, but I think it's just, I think it's so important for people to understand that they are reconciled and a part of experiencing that life of reconciliation is surrendering their idea of what is possible. I tell this young man that I'm mentoring, he's 21 years old. I tell him like, look, you're 21 years old. There's so much about yourself in this world that you do not know. I tell him, please refuse to identify as anything other than a source that is trend than than the source that is transcendent and eternal and knows you from the end to the beginning. Like, don't do it. Don't live your life that small. Just don't do it. So, man, you when we first got to know each other, we read each other's books. Which is, yeah. <laughs> and I always thank right. the Lord that, you know, when I get to know someone, they hand me their book, it's actually good. <laughs> I get yes. every, every day I come to work, I have stacks of books that people have sent. Um, your book, Saints, is amazing. And uh, it's you, talking man. about deconstructing your faith because um, so, so many of us, in fact, you have a quote that I put in my new book that's coming out. Um, oh, wow. and, I, and it is most of what people know about God is secondhand information. And I've got that as a quote on starting one of the chapters because so many people, they don't realize that the things that they accept to, are true about God, they'll even argue, aren't even in Scripture because they're raised a certain way. And so your book, Saints, really talks about what do you believe? Let's get down to the nitty gritty. How is it that we become a saint? So if people are hearing you right now, they're like, dude, I want to hear more about what that guy has to say. I would say that is an excellent book to read. It's, a, it's an easy read, but it's a very profound read. Also, though, you have um, some stuff on sons and daughters on, on your website and available. And I talk about that where people can get more of what you have to say about some of this stuff. Yeah. So we, that being the next generation of Beveers, we found an organization called Sons and Daughters. And what we did is we took a lot of the messages that are the hallmark messages of Messenger International. And we took them and we're essentially repurposing them. Um, using fresh language for the next generation, uh, primarily Gen Z and millennials. And so what we've done is we've created this and it happened spontaneously. It happened back in 2017. It started with just a little test project and then it just flourished into a whole movement. Um, we've got ambassadors now in I think 60 countries and we have over 300 chapters all over the world. And these are pastors, these are young adult leaders, um, these are people who even are disenfranchised and not going to church. And this is really like their only connection to Christendom right now. And we're discipling these leaders. We're helping them grow. We're helping them create community. And um, we're giving them content for them to go through on a semester basis. And so that's sonsanddaughters.tv. Um, if people want to check that out, like we just, we just did a, um, a whole course on let's talk about sex. And we talked, we talked a lot about this stuff that you and I have talked about today when it comes to sexuality and gender. And uh, we have a course called Fierce Unity, talking about this moment and the unity narrative and different things like that. And so uh, people are welcome to access. And the amazing thing, Ken, is it's all free of charge. Everything that we do, we're just doing it to give away, to give people so that they can um, use it to disciple the young people in their lives. And also for the, the people who are out there who are in that 18 to 35 age group, this is going to be great content for you as well. That's good stuff, man. I can just tell you, for everybody listening, the more you hear Addison and his brothers and his parents teach, the more blessed you're going to be. So thanks, brother. Uh, we got to do this more often. Next time we do this, though, because we've, I don't know if people can see the visual issues that if you're watching this, that we've had Addison actually move rooms. But <laughs> the, the next time we're going to do this in person here in yes. Colorado Springs, 
We're going to go to Loyal Coffee. We're going to get a cinnamon twist and a cappuccino and sit here and do this the right way, man. I agree. There we go. Thanks, Ken. Always good talking with you. You too, man. Thanks for listening to On the Edge Podcast with Ken Harrison. For a lot of you, this is our first time meeting, and I want to tell the men listening about an organization I'm the current chairman of, Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is an organization founded by Coach Bill McCartney that's led men across the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Promise Keepers is calling men back to courageous and bold servant leadership. To learn more and get involved in the mission of Promise Keepers, visit promisekeepers.org. Follow on social media or download the Promise Keepers app on Apple Store or Google Play by searching Promise Keepers. Through the Promise Keepers app, you'll receive access to devotionals, Bible studies, and other great articles and video content, and a community to build friendships, lead your family, and become transformative leaders. See you next time for On the Edge with Ken Harrison.